Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to all of you and welcome. Welcome back to the first of two sessions with Dr. Fred Johnson. He's going to be speaking to us today about some news you may have read about in the early 50s, 54, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the tragedy of the death of Emmett Till. You may have remembered that part of the news. You may not have known that his mother insisted he be buried in an open casket. Some of you are nodding so that mourners can come and realize the brutality of his death. So that's something we'll be talking about today. And um, Dr. Johnson has decided that he would like to share information about this tragedy as seen through Emma Till's mother, Mamie uh, Mobley, or Till Mobley. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So um, we're looking forward to this first presentation today. Um, Dr. Johnson is a professor of history at Hope. He's been here for 22 years. Pretty good. <laughs> It sounds worse than it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all glad about that. Likewise, we're very likewise, glad about yes. that. Uh, his BA is from, now, do you say Bowie or Bowie? Bowie. Bowie, okay. Bowie State University, and it's in uh, Maryland, and MA and PhD degrees from Kent State University in Ohio. Mm -hmm. I would like to share with you something I was just chatting with Fred about. He had the opportunity to spend May term, Hope's May term in Vietnam, leading eight, eight students, all from Hope, mm -hmm. all from Hope College. And when we were talking before about teaching this class, he was speaking to me, this was earlier in June, about the horrible jet lag that he was still experiencing. And I asked him this morning, he said, it's almost gone now. <laughs> So we're excited to have Dr. Johnson back. So please welcome him to the classroom. Thank you. Thank you, good morning. Thank you, thank you, Kip, for that great introduction. And yes, I had the privilege of taking eight of our students from Hope to Vietnam. We went to the Vietnamese Chinese, uh, to as far north as the Vietnamese Chinese border, and then down to Da Nang, which was the second largest base, U.S. base during the Vietnam conflict. We visited a Hmong refugee site or Hmong women's uh, birthing center where there's, an, there's a UN project there where the Hmong people, I found out that the Hmong men and their culture are not allowed to be anywhere near women when they're giving childbirth. So for a number of years, there was a high mortality rate among mothers and children, but they decided to do a UN initiative, train midwives. So these midwives started teaching women about prenatal care, postnatal care. So the death dropped for, dropped for the children and the mothers. And then of course, we visited an Agent Orange facility where the children, there's a fourth and fifth generation of children who are still dealing with the effects, cognitive and physical effects of Agent Orange. It just breaks your heart to see these kids. And then we went to Ho Chi Minh City, once known as Saigon, and saw the actual tanks that broke through the front gate in April, 1975, that pretty much said that the war in Vietnam was over. I took the students by myself on the day before we left. Of course, we had to get PCR COVID testing 24 hours before we left. And my co, my co leader tested positive. So they couldn't go. The question was put to me what do we do? Do we, do we leave or don't we? I said, let me remind you United States Marine Corps. <laughs> we go. And it was great. Like Kia pointed out, we talked about this back in the spring. This is really Kit's inspiration, really. The idea was to talk about Emmett Till, but look at Emmett Till from a different perspective, through the eyes of his mother. Because generally speaking, Emmett Till and what happened to him, the, 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 it's not the slaying of Emmett Till, although he was slain. It wasn't the murder of Emmett Till, although he was murdered. It was the lynching of Emmett Till. So to further contextualize this and properly set the stage for what we're going to get into, how many of you have been watching the hearings for the January 6th committee? 
Because if you've been watching that, this will help you understand in hindsight what happened to Emmett Till as well. Because there's a good number of presumptions that have gone on that pertain to January 6th that were also in play in 1955 when this 14 year old teenager was murdered, lynched in Money, Mississippi. So let's begin. Mamie Till Mobley or Mamie Till lived a life of struggle and what it did, it produced a reaction that may turn her into something that maybe she never would have been had it not been for that struggle, had it not been for that tragedy in her life. I can tell you that without getting into elaborating on details to some family dynamics of my own, I recently had figured out how to take those kind of negative situations and channel them into productivity. You'd be surprised what you're gonna do when you take struggle and turn it into something that makes you, propels you forward. It can be a powerful, powerful force. Born 1921, maybe Mamie Elizabeth Carson in Webb, Mississippi. Her family left in 1922. And they settled in the Chicago area neighborhood of Argo. Her parents divorced and it, when she was 13 years old. So her response to that divorce was to just die, just completely allow herself to be consumed the schoolwork. She became so good in school. She became such a strong academic student that she ended up becoming the first black student to make A honor roll and the fourth black student to graduate from the predominantly white Argo community high school. Now, you know, that kind of information always is kind of surprising to me because you're talking about the 1920s and 30s when segregation in America is not some anomaly. It is the rule of the day and particularly in Chicago, which even today is still one of the most segregated cities in the country. So the fact that this goes on, that she's able to do this is kind of curious, and it at least calls for a question about how is that possible? At age 18, she met a man named Lewis Till, who's from a place called New Madrid, Missouri, who's an amateur boxer and considered himself to be something of a ladies' man, Lothario. Uh, or in popular terms, a jerk. <laughs> Her parents disapproved of this relationship. But in October, 1940, Mamie married Lewis Till. They both were only 18 years old. Closures and uh, uh, turn your speaker off is what I'm... So nine months later, July 25th, 1941, she gave birth to Emmett Lewis Till. Now it's 1941. Yeah, and I, a year. I think we're getting the and just a few months later, August, right. September, October, November, December, World War II will begin for the United States when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. That's relevant to what we're talking about. In 1942, Mamie and her husband Lewis separated because, well, I mentioned that he was a jerk and he was a physically abusive jerk and a verbally abusive jerk. He tried, he tried choking her to death. So she threw scalding hot water on him. I said, go for you, good for you, sister. <laughs> she got a restraining order against him and he didn't leave her alone. So the judge, he went to court and the judge said, you have a choice. You can join the army or go to jail. Guess what? He chose the army. He was eventually sent to Europe, fought in the European theater of war where he got in trouble with military authorities there for, so the records show he raped an Italian woman and I think he murdered her and he was eventually, eventually executed by hanging. In the early 1950s, Mamie and Emmett Till moved to Chicago's South Side where she married, met, she met and married a guy named Pink Bradley. They divorced two years later. And then came 1955. But before we get into 1955, we, re we really cannot understand this story without getting a larger assessment 
of context. For historians, for so many people, context means everything. You know, to try and help my students understand context, I explained to them, I, I explained it to them, I'm trying to, you know, you have to find ways of communicating with, with college students, young people in a way that they understand. So I say that context is like this. Say, for example, you're coming out of the, the Baltimore Student Center. You look across the yard there, you see your boyfriend, girlfriend coming out of Graves Hall, and they're all hugged up and tight with somebody else. You think you so, hey, you know, I thought we had a thing going on. And they're just laughing and joking, having a good time, and you feel your temperature rising. And then all of a sudden, you walk up on them, and you, by the time you're in a fighting mood, if you say, hey, what's happening? And then they go like, well, so-and-so just fell. And I'm helping them until their ankle gets stronger. Whole situation changes. Context. Context. <laughs> so first things first. Context, meaning that in order to understand what happens to Emmett Till through the eyes of his mother and how they impacted her, and then eventually the United States, we got to understand Mamie Till's relationship with the United States, and then that United States, not just overall, but that United States in the year 1955. What was it like? What was going on? Who was involved? 1955, some things were beginning to happen. Somebody remembers a 15 cent hamburger. Never seen one of those. Nineteen fifty-five. You know, when it comes to fashion, do you notice that some fashions that go out of style come back in style eventually? Nineteen fifty-five looked like it was a pretty fun year, but nineteen fifty-five in America proved that for a good part of America it was a very white country, at least by the depictions given in these photos. Nineteen fifty-five was the year that Marlon Brando won an Oscar for his performance in On the Waterfront. 1955, apparently was a year, a good year for land battleships. <laughs> 1955, this thing ended up being eventually uh, a tanker for the US Air Force called the KC, well not this airplane, but airplanes like it. But you know, it's the dawn of the jet age. 1955, a year where drive-in meant drive-in, not drive-through. Nineteen fifty-five was a very good year. <laughs> but nineteen fifty-five also had some other things going on in nineteen fifty-five. In 1955, America was a very divided country, and I mean divided down to its DNA. I am forever struck by the, the dedication of a society that took time to, to segregate people on the basis of some of the most common elements of life, such as water. Every living thing, even cockroaches need water to live. And people took time to make sure that there were draw, dividing lines between that. 1955, of course, was before the Montgomery City bus boycott. So this was not just a tradition or a custom, it was the law, the law of the land. In 1955, this is not from 1955. Full disclosure, this is actually a photo from August 7th, 1930 in Marion, Indiana. Now on August 7th, 19. 30, this guy right here is pointing up. The reason why this is in here so we can understand that in 1955, in addition to everything we've seen, there's also this right here, which again ties back into the January 6th committee. These folk right here on August 7th, 1930, had gathered beneath two dead bodies that had been murdered, a double homicide committed, A. Smith and Tommy Shipp. Their feet are dangling from the tree, from a tree, and the tree 
just in case there's not enough irony in your life, the tree is located outside of the courthouse. You know, that place where justice takes place or is supposed to. So this mob of people has gathered on August 7th, 1930. We're not talking about the Neolithic period, the Paleolithic period, the Jurassic, Triassic, Cenozoic period. We're talking about modern America that has fought one world war, the world's first color TV sitting that was broadcast in 1928. We have men fighting transatlantic, transatlantic, transoceanic travel. Dr. Robert H. Gardner is doing rocketry experiments to see can we get to the moon at some point. In that year, in very modern America, a group of American citizens who have been present and witnessed directly a double homicide have gathered together for a picture and are looking directly to the eye of the camera. And in addition to the insult of smiling about it, there's young and old, there's male and female, so there's no gender exclusion here about one being more violent than the other. And the narrative of what's going on in 1930, just as it was in 1955, is that you could kill two black people and take a picture of it. And the political, legal, social, economic system is structured so that no one will hold you accountable. You can literally get away with it. You can look into the eye of the camera and not fear being questioned, being deposed, going to jail. And when people have that assurance reinforced by legislation and the law and the economy and culture and history and custom, if they can take your life, what else can they not take? Your job, your home, your education, your future, and if they take your life, what's left? Nothing. So in 1930, that reality also advanced to 1955. Mamie Till is born into a world where this is the rule. This is just it. Or as some people might say, it is what it is. Her son Emmett Till is born into a world where this is what it is. Imagine being born into a world where this is what it is, and you're a teenager with all of the teenager's energy and precociousness and daring do and boldness and willingness to challenge and push against the envelope. And if you're a black mother with a teenager in that kind of world, you live in daily, momentary, not daily, but second by second, nanosecond by nanosecond fight for your child. To bring a black child into the world, if you're, if you're Mamie Till, you are on pins and needles every day. So that answers the question, what's going on? And it tells a real story. Now I mentioned legislatively because prior to 1930 and 1924, 1925, 1926, 1927, 1928, I don't have the pictures in here I should have now that I think about it. But prior to this happening in Marion, Indiana, uh, in the 1920s, so for several years, there were marches in Washington, D.C. of the Ku Klux Klan, people dressed in full regalia, hoods and everything, robes going down Pennsylvania Avenue. Now, here's the thing that is communicated to me every time I see those photos. First of all, that happened because in 1915, there was a movie produced by D.W. Griffith called Birth of a Nation was told a preferred history of Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, that 12 years. It told a story of a Reconstruction that never happened, which kind of dovetails into the battles that we fight today about people that want to have a, a history they prefer as opposed to the one that, that, that actually happened. Now, D. Deborah Griffith's tale of Reconstruction was one where ravenous, lascivious, lewd, lusting black men, ironically, black soldiers played by white men in black face, because real black men couldn't get a job in the movies. 
and they're stuffed in the ballot box. So they're corrupt, which feeds an already held stereotype. They're chasing after dainty white women, which feeds another stereotype, dainty, because Southerners already had assumed for themselves, we must protect our white Southern womanhood, which was an excuse that was used. And Ida B. Wells said this over and over in her anti-lynching campaign, stop using that as an excuse for just lynching people. You were protecting your white womanhood. And in response to that film, in one scene, the main character, Gus, proposes marriage to the, the, what, the, the main object of his desires. And she, of course, is horrified. It's, a, it's post eighteen Civil War. So things are what they are. Well, he starts chasing her up a mountain. She threatens that if you don't stop chasing me, I'm going to jump. And so she does toward death. Well, she has a relative who is a former Confederate officer who is distraught. And he's wondering, what can I do? These black people, these Negro soldiers are just running amok. And he remembers hearing a story that black people are afraid of ghosts and has this idea that if they dress up in sheets and hoods, claiming to be the dead ghosts of Confederate soldiers, come back from the grave, that's one way of scaring them into submission and restoring order. And so for the rest of the film, they go on a rampage and the Ku Klux Klan ends up being the hero organization of the movie. That's 1915. That year, that year in Stone Mountain, Georgia, the modern day Ku Klux Klan was reborn. Now follow me on this. They'd already won the culture war. By 1915, the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, which pretty much had been neutered or made non effective because the 13th Amendment, among other things, said that people shall not be held against their will unless lawfully convicted, duly convicted of a crime. Southerners saw right through that when it started passing black codes or vagrancy laws. Like if you're a black person in South Carolina in 1865, you don't have a job, you can be arrested and thrown in jail. Well, you've been arrested. You went before, you went before the justice of the peace or you went before the magistrate. Do you have a job? No, you don't. Are you a vagrant? You had to be a vagrant because you violated the law. So you are guilty. So as far as they're concerned, you were violating the law, you were arrested, you were tried, you were convicted, you go to jail. That happened over and over and over again through various laws throughout the South, throughout the entire South. And let us say, for example, that if you're that person in South Carolina and you get thrown into that jail, and then you're there for two or three weeks, something happens and you have another three or four more months added onto your sentence. And then several more get thrown in there with you for those vagrancy laws. And that's just one type of law. Well, they're not gonna let you just sit around having three hots in a cot and not doing anything. So they put you to work on, let's say, a railroad or mining or lumbering. You're a prisoner, which means you have no say so on what you do and where you go. So the railroad company is getting free labor from the jail that's owned by the state. And it pays the railroad company a reduced fee. If you're out there working against your will on a project for economic betterment, what is it called? When you are made to work against your will and you're not getting paid for it. That's how they got around the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was supposed to deal with dual citizenship. Passed in 1868. Why? Because, well, in 1865, when the 13th Amendment was passed, there were 4 million Black people in the United States. They didn't parachute it in. They just sneak across the southern border. They were here, born right here in the United States of America. So the issue is now, what do we do with these people? And that question is a repugnant way of putting it, but the attitude of what do we do with them, you know, the, the assumption of we, can, we must do something with them. They are our problem to be done something with. That was in the mindset, even up until 1930 and then beyond. They're not here, they're here, they're born here. So we, the 14th Amendment, among other things, establishes the concept of dual citizenship. You are a citizen of the nation in which you are born or naturalized. A citizen of the, of the nation, of the state where you reside, 
you know, the nation that that state belongs to. The 14th Amendment also dealt with something called due process and equal protection of the laws. The 15th Amendment gave black folks the right to vote. Let me reframe that. The 15th Amendment finally did the right thing and recognized that black people had earned the right to vote. Sadly, it was only black men. Women would still have to fight for that. By 1915, the 13th Amendment had been, they had run an in run on it. Slavery was pretty much in fact, if not in name. The 14th Amendment, civil rights, due process, equal protections, pff, there's so much ash in the wind. And the 15th Amendment was completely done. So by 1915, you didn't need a rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. In other words, if you wanted to win the political, social, economic war, they had done that by 1915. So why was there a need for a rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan? This was the gift that D. Deborah Griffith gave to the United States. And you need to understand that when people went to the movies to see this film, people at the end of the movie, people stood up and gave roaring, robust applause. D. Deborah Griffith, in addition to being a filmmaker, was also a businessman and not a stupid one. He knew what product his countrymen will respond to most positively. And what they saw on the screen fit the story that A, they had been told, or B, the one they wanted to believe. Either way, what they saw reinforced the notion that black men were dangerous, black people were out of control, that they had to be, that you had to establish some type of parameters for them that violence and terror was acceptable. So the Ku Klux Klan was reborn. And in the 1920s, when they were marching down Pennsylvania Avenue, what message does it send to people like A. Smith and Tommy Ship when domestic terrorists, and let me be very specific about this. I'm talking about terrorists on the same level as Al Qaeda or ISIS. Because it doesn't matter if the terrorist is American or from wherever it is in the Middle East or from Africa or Central America, or wherever they come from, Terrorism is terrorism. So these domestic terrorists are marching down Pennsylvania Avenue, and in all the photos you see of them, in the background, there's the dome of the US Capitol, where there's the House of Representatives and the Senate, the world's oldest, most esteemed deliberative body. So what message does it send to people like A. Smith and Tommy Ship if the legislators, the people who go there to represent all of our interests in the house, in the people's house, know that outside domestic terrorists are marching down Pennsylvania Avenue and they pass the laws that give us the parameters of what we can and can't do, what we should and shouldn't go. If they know that terrorists are marching outside and they're okay with that, if they're okay with that, then what they do is, then they're also okay with what they do. Many of you all have heard that the only way bad men can triumph is for good men and women to do nothing. It had been a battle from the start in the United States, a battle against toxic beliefs, The juncture that led to the demise, the violent demise of Emmett Till was founded upon centuries and decades of a, pref a preference to have doubts and beliefs about black people having courage. The preferred belief was that they were sniveling, incompetent boobs and idiots. There were doubts about their intellect, stupid, incapable of learning. The preferred belief, Morons, children, doubts about their willingness and ability to work hard. This one, I must confess, puzzles me all the time. Let me get this straight. You force someone to be slaves for 246 years and they're the lazy ones? Even Abraham Lincoln, I'll get to that in just a second. The preferred belief was embodied or encaptured or captured very well in this post reconstruction cartoon advertisement, which was anti Freedmen's Bureau. Now, the Freedmen's Bureau 
was passed in early 1865. It was, it was designed primarily to meet the needs or address the needs of black people who are coming out of slavery. It stands to reason that someone who's been born a slave and been, been told what to do all their life and does not know how to read and write, it does not know, does not know how to handle money. They're not stupid, they're just not learned, they're just not taught. But this particular cartoon here, the Freedmen's Bureau had three things to do. Teach folk how to read and write, address their material needs of housing, clothing, and teaching them how to sort of make a living for themselves and help them transition from slavery to freedom and it was run out of the War Department. The precedent was, was that it was one of the first and largest expansions of government power into the lives of everyday citizens in US history. Now, the next biggest expansion will come during the Great Depression with, uh, with Franklin Roosevelt's alphabet soup of programs, the TVA, the, NR, the, the National Recovery Act, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the, right, the Federal Writers Project, a number of them. But the reaction to the Freedmen's Bureau was this. People who were opposed to it said, take a look at this. The Freedmen's Bureau is an agency to keep the Negro in idleness at the expense of the white man. And just in case you didn't get it, you see the big dopey looking guy in the front who's very, very dark, looking up at the sky, not a care in, either his mind is empty or he doesn't have a care in the world. But either way, there he is doing nothing and living off the fat of the land while these poor characters over here are chopping wood and plowing. How come they have to work so hard? Why are they putting out so much? And this guy just gets to sit around and do what? Do nothing? Twice vetoed by the president. That would be Andrew Johnson. Made a law by Congress. Support Congress, you support the Negro. Sustain the president and you protect the white man. The, the not so subtle message is, they don't deserve this. They're inherently lazy. They're inherently incompetent. And they don't deserve all this free largesse from the government that's being gotten off of your sweat. Is this fair? No, it's not fair. No one thinks this is fair. No one would think, would think this is fair. And in the post-Civil War South, where there's hunger and famine because the Civil War produced all the things that warfare produces, refugees, desperation, hunger, plague, famine, all kinds of things. So in that kind of environment, in the post-Civil War South, this is going to capture people's attention very quickly. This is a preferred belief, but as I mentioned, there are questions about that because, you know, even on um, March 4th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln, in, in considering this issue of, of ethic and work ethic, he said in one part of his second inaugural address, it may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. Look, I don't want to put too much of a big halo on Abraham Lincoln. He came to emancipation, not willingly, more or less, he was guided there, maneuvered there by circumstances. He did it as a thing that he finally had to do because the Civil War left him no choice. But the good thing about Abraham Lincoln was that he finally got there. Some people never got there. And by March 4th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln, president, 16th president of the United States, with blood on his hands up to his shoulders, one can only imagine the spiritual, emotional, psychological toll it must have taken on him, knowing that all those men's and women's lives were on him. And that the war would not stop until there had been surrender and until the United States was united again, as much as it could be. But in that hour on March 4th, 1865, he's head. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we be not judged. If God wills that this civil war continue until, now stay with me and listen to this, until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil. Do you know what it means for a guy who in 1858 during the Lincoln-Douglas debate says, I don't think that the black man is equal to the white man. I have no intention of bringing equality. In 1858, Abraham Lincoln, before he ran for president, in fact, when he ran for president, the Republican platform in 1860 said that he was completely okay with slavery existing, just keep it where it is. It just don't want it to spend to the territories. So I'm perfectly fine with having black people remaining enslaved. I just don't want it to go any further west into the new territories. 
So for that guy to get to a point where he's saying he's recognizing that there have been 250 years of unrequited toil, unrequited toil, unrequited, unrequited love. That's a hard love to be in. If you've never been in love by yourself, that's it. You're in love with somebody, they either know or don't care or they don't know. Either way, it's a tough position to be in emotionally. 250 years of toil where there's been no response, no conversation, no acknowledgement, no benefit to the people doing the toil. The president of the United States is saying that. And then to double back, he almost seems to be puzzled with the situation when he says, it may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance. I tell my students all the time, it would have been one thing if Lincoln had said, it may seem strange to, it may seem strange that any man should dare to ask God's assistance, but he qualified it. He said, a just God's assistance. I'm talking about a God who knows the difference between justice and injustice. A God who has an opinion about right and wrong. A God who has weighed in consistently through biblical history on the side of the downtrodden, the slave, the guy in the margin, the widow, the orphan, the person that's been cheated on, lied to, overtaxed, the slave and the Hebrew slave in Egypt, that God that will come down and be a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day to lead them through the desert, that God that will take his breath and part a Red Sea so that his children can get through, the ones who have been put upon, harassed, beaten, and deny all their civil liberties. And then when those who are trying to re-enslave them, pursue them, he will cause the waters to fall in on them. You're going to ask that dead God to help you wring your bread from the sweat of other men's faces. Do you know who you're dealing with? Do you understand what you're asking of him? The same God who's going to take his own flesh and blood and send him to earth to die for you. You want him to do that for you. Clearly, you do not understand who this is. That's why it may seem strange. And it does seem strange when you put it like that. There are doubts about black peoples. And look, I'm not joking when I say this. I dare say there are people that have this, this viewpoint today. They doubt whether or not black people are fully human into the, into the, through the 19th century, into the 20th century, particularly the early decades of the 20th century, during something called the eugenics movement. There were people who would argue with you till they were blue in the face about whether or not black people actually were fully human. The preferred belief was that at best, they were a missing link. At worst, they were apes, monkeys. That epithet is still thrown around. Well, in this video clip from it will be glory. They're raiding Derry in Georgia, but the commander says, look at them. They're little, little monkey children. They can't be controlled. No one's going to put them in. No one's going to put them in combat. And what he's saying, even though it's a movie, he was right. Why would you put monkey children into combat? They certainly can't help you on the battlefield. So African-Americans, the world that Mamie Till inhabited, the world that her son was born into, it had been like being saddled with the curse of Sisyphus, pushing that, having fooled the gods, he was cursed to push a boulder up a mountain every day. And every time he got the mountain to the top, it would roll back down, he had to push it again. But here's the question. The question then is that in the war, World War II, where the Americans fought against the Japanese imperialists and the Nazis, I mean, it's not that the Nazis were one of history's most bigoted regimes. It was the most bigoted regime in all of human history. And given human history, you had to work at that to achieve that level. But during that fight, African-Americans, like the soldiers who were part of the 761st Tank Battalion of George Patton's Third Army, asked the question, why do we fight? The Marines who finally were allowed to join the Marine Corps in 1942, even though they were chained in segregated facilities at Montfort Point, asked the question, why do we fight? The Tuskegee Airmen who had to fight to get into the fight. Same question, why do we fight? Dory Miller, who was a mess attendant, that was all black people were allowed to do in the Navy in the early 1940s. On December 7, 1941, he broke the rules and shot down Japanese aircraft. 
and wore for himself the Navy Cross. He eventually, as I say, was awarded the Navy Cross. And part of the commendation, he's, the Navy Cross is being pinned on him here by Admiral Chester, Chester W. Nimitz, Commander in Chief, Pacific Forces. And it says, as you can read there, extraordinary courage and disregard for his own personal safety during the attack on the fleet in Pearl Harbor territory of Hawaii by Japanese forces on December 7th, 1941. While at the side of this, his captain on the bridge, Miller, despite enemy strafing and bombing and in the face of a serious fire, assisted in moving his captain who had been mortally wounded to a place of greater safety and later manned and operated a machine gun directed at enemy Japanese attacking aircraft until he was forced to leave the bridge. In the Naval Services of the United States, there's only one medal higher than the Navy Cross. That is Congressional Medal of Honor. Dory Miller won the Navy Cross for services on December 7th, 1941. Now, those black men that had to fight to get into the Marine Corps, those soldiers of the 761st Tank Battalion, those airmen of the, of the Tuskegee Airmen, and I'm just scratching the surface of all the people who in that environment where Ku Klux Klansmen had been marching down Pennsylvania Avenue and people had been swinging from trees through mob violence sanctioned, not by what people did say, but more what they didn't say, but the kind of a thing, why would they fight? That is a pressing, compelling question, but they did fight. So what was the result for all that service in an environment like that? Did people understand it? Did they recognize it? What was the result of all that wartime service? The answer was, so what? Who cares? If you have those kind of beliefs we talked about where you are inherently stupid and there's a question about your humanity and you are people just insist that you're a coward, no matter what kind of Marine Corps suit you, you put on, what kind of airplane you fly, what kind of tank you drive, if people believe that, they believe that. And it is a tremendously big lie about the intellect, the courage, the competency. So literally putting your neck on the line against Japanese imperialists and Nazis doesn't amount to a hill of beans. So what? Who cares you did that? In this video clip, this, this individual, I found this right before a class one day, I taught slavery and race in America, 1619 to president during the spring. This individual is talking about how he treats his black people well. And we always, we always treat them nice and we, and we give them food and we do this. He's talking about people like they were still slaves and patting himself on the back because he treats them nice. You know, the way you treat your, your pet nice, something to be kept. Now, this is the, this is the 20th century. This is after World War II. If you just don't understand the connection that we have with the colored people. You can never whip these buds if you don't keep you in them. We'll talk about him later. You can never whip. Okay. Into that world, Emmett Lewis Till is born into that world. If you're Mamie Till, for the moment that the doctor gets that kid on the rear, he takes his first breath. If you're Mamie Till, you're happy for a moment, but only for a moment. Because after that moment, you realize, wait a minute. You look outside the hospital window, you realize this is the world my son is entering, a broken America. You realize that black men like A. Smith and Tommy Ship, they've been lynched for things that it could meet be the needs of the moment. You know that you've been living in a world where, where, like they say in the book Without Sanctuary, Leon F. Litwet talks about how sometimes newspaper, local newspapers ran ads, you know, lynching to occur on Thursday afternoon. Trains were diverted. Schools were let out so that children could accompany the parents. These were community events and celebrations. You know that you live in a world because if you're Mamie Till in 1941, you surely have heard about Marion, Indiana, 1930, 11 years before, where a mob gathered and looked into the eye of the camera and said, cheese, and nothing happened when they were standing beneath two dead bodies hanging from a tree outside the Hall of Justice. If you're Mamie Till, you recognize that. 
you remember that. And you know that your son, and know that black men who are seen as a threat, and the usual reason for lynching them is because they're lusting after white women. You know that your son is living in a very, very dangerous world. And as it turns out, that dangerous world consumed Emmett Till. And as it turned out, Emmett Till from Chicago went to Money, Mississippi in 1955. He was out there playing with his cousins and went into a general store owned by Roy Bryant. And there was a young white woman named Carolyn Bryant behind the counter. And we don't know for sure because after all, Emmett Till died before we could get it from him. But his cousin thinks that he said, hey baby, or whistled or something. Either way, this 14 year old kid from Chicago did not know the rules of not just any Southern state, but the state of Mississippi. I once read some place where Martin Luther King Jr. said that Mississippi was the only third world country inside the United States. And as we shall hear later on, William Bradford Huey, a Southern, a very good journalist who interviewed the two men who eventually were acquitted of the murder of this kid. One of them told him that when they came by the grandfather's house that night, now stay with me here, because this is why I asked if you've been listening to the January 6th committee hearings, especially yesterday, because one of the, one of the poll workers, Shay, the poll worker said that people showed up at her door and bars into her grandmother's house and just, just felt they had the right to go in there. They assumed they had the right to know that nothing would happen to them and indeed nothing did happen to them. They had burst into this woman's house and were looking for her and her mother on the suspicions that they had done something to defraud the election. Did they have any authority? No. Did they have any kind of judicial sanction? No. They just assumed it was their right. Likewise, J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant drove to Mose Wright's house that night and broke into his house and walked inside and grabbed his boy. Did they have any authority? No. Did they have any judicial sanction? No. What gave them the authority to do that? The knowledge that you can sit up there and lynch two people in Merritt, Indiana on, on a tree outside the Hall of Justice and nothing will happen to you. That's what they get the authority from. It's not so much what they do have, it's what people have not said. They know you can literally commit murder and get away with it. And so they do. And then a trial is had. It's a spectacle before the country. And then the all white jury in Mississippi goes out and they come back with a verdict in one hour, total acquittal. After Moe's Wright, the boy's uncle stands up in court in Mississippi, a black man in Mississippi. The moment he says the following two words, dar he. The prosecution says, do you recognize the men who came into your house that night? Yeah, they're back there. The moment he said Darhi in that broken language, the moment he said that, he was no longer a citizen of Mississippi because he had just signed his own death warrant. So there, testify out of here. We're talking about the United States of America. Rule of law, constitution. We hold these truths to be self-evident and so on. To say that Mamie Till's heart was broken is a spectacular understatement. It's the broken heart of a woman who's already had her challenges when it comes to love anyway. It's the broken heart of a mother. It's the broken heart of a black mother who's lived with this fear and horror all her life. And then the horror came to pass. Kind of recalls Job, doesn't it? The thing I worried about the most, I feared the most, it finally settled upon me. We're going to get this play for you all because, you know, we need to see this. We'll come back and revisit this. But, you know, 
there's there's then having the grown up in the south i mean let's, image, let's just put it out there right found. having grown up in the south having grown up as a black male in the that south even when i grew up crying. at some point you have to you have to learn to yelling. to put on a, 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 a type of happened. armor that just helps you just helps you power through this kind of stuff the grief but this in the house this, this in the house was horrible you look at her face she's this is emmett till's cousin recalling the moment when they found out the screaming what had happened the disbelief and how his mother immediately the the sheriff Man, it was just devastating. the sheriff this woman is also it was hard to see her heartbroken and maybe it is more powerful not to hear the words because you can see from their faces what they're going through emotionally but she had to pull and the narration says that, that to Mamie Till, get the once she found out bring that the sheriff to Chicago. who presided over all the court proceedings was trying to bury the body in Mississippi, literally trying to bury the evidence. She called the governor, she called the governor, she called Mary now Daly, the who had just been newly elected sheriff, in Chicago. She called everybody. This guy was the sheriff. Emmett's body be now, buried immediately before sheriff, the sun sets that day. Yeah, I urge you. Now the Tallahatchie and County Sheriff to, H.C. Strider to link orders for this, that for eyes Emmett's the body this guy be right here, buried immediately before the... There's one part of it. Now the Tallahatchie County Sheriff H.C. Strider... Where this sheriff, there's a segment where he says like, you know, we never have any problems until... He says, we never have any problems with, we never have any problems with our Southern niggers until lawyers come down here in the South and start telling them what to do, blah, blah, blah. So he says, our, again, like, you know, there's this presumption of ownership. And you really need to, to, to grasp, to embrace how deeply embedded and felt and believed that this notion of ownership, of entitlement was that these guys had. So Mimi Till went into overdrive to retrieve the body of her son and bring it back to Chicago. She was already changing. At this point, she's still just a mother trying to get her son. Its body be because this is, a, this is an America, the this is the United day. States of America, where if you're the a grave black is kid actually being dug murdered when in Mississippi, you can't even be guaranteed of getting a decent burial. There's nothing left. First of all, why is the sheriff dead. even making that decision? And now they're going to when desecrate the body as well? Deciding that Seriously, the body I, I mean, come buried. on. There's something if they treat really, you like really that in that death, they're it to gives you an here. insight into how they treat you in life. For his mom, that was an immediate red flag. She said, I do the know if it. Miss Mamie, this is Mamie Till calling everybody. Call everybody calling she knew. everybody. She called she the governor. She called Mayor Daly. She called everybody she could touch, and finally got them engaged to to bring the child home. And so it began. Watching that clip, that four minute clip. Yeah, I wept. And what began for Mimi Till, clearly her job as a mother was over. She was no longer the mother of a live child, at least. She's still a mother, but her mother's days, her, her mother's day from that, that point forward would never be the same. Life had already turned her into Something of a lion, the death of her son turned her into a formidable lion. She made the decision in 1955, 1955, two years after we had signed an armistice with North Korea, the ceasefire that brought the Korean conflict to a close, well, at least stopped the shooting. It's still still going on technically, but stopped the shooting in North Korea. 1955, the year after the French were beat at Den Ben Phu, which will begin America's long, miserable experience in Vietnam. 1955, two years before the Russians would launch Sputnik into space and generate such alarm in the United States that in 1958, America would establish the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and begin a race for the moon. 
1955, the year that the Russians, in response to the Americans and the Western allies establishing NATO in 1949, the Western Alliance, in 1955, the Russians and their Eastern allies, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, East Germany, would establish the Warsaw Pact, the counterweight to NATO. 1955, one year before the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, when Hungarians would literally vote with their feet to walk toward freedom, leaving the Soviet dominated Communist Party in Hungary. Nineteen fifty five, six years after Mao Zedong kicked Chiang Kai shek off of mainland China onto Formosa, today you call it Taiwan. Nineteen fifty five, six years after the Russians exploded their first atomic device, ending America's nuclear monopoly. Nineteen fifty five, in that year, this very wounded mother and a very dead son, a wounded mother who had to fight tooth and nail to get the body of her slain child back from a sheriff who's trying to hide the evidence from two guys who were let off anyway. And I've read accounts that the two men that killed Emmett Till, they never denied doing it. They admitted doing it. They admitted doing it. And other accounts have said that the jury, which took one hour to deliberate, that it would have taken even less time if they hadn't stopped, if somebody hadn't stopped to get a soda on the way back to the courtroom. In 1955, she decided, you know what? I will show the world the face of my son. She said, I want them to see what they did to my boy. You know, 1955, those veterans of the 761st Tank Battalion, the Tuskegee Airmen, the Montfort Point Marines, People like Dory Miller, Dory Miller will be lost at sea uh, on an aircraft carrier later on in World War II. But all those black servicemen who have done their duty, just like the Harlem Hellfighters did during World War I, just like the 54th Massachusetts did when they charged Fort Wagner on July 16th or July 18th, 1863, just like the 5,000 African Americans that fought for the Continental Army during the American Revolution. Just like every black woman and man who's been in combat, you know, saying, listen, I know you think that I'm stupid and incompetent and scared and cowardly and don't have what it takes to be of use to you, but I intend to put my neck and life on the line to show you that not only are those things wrong, but I am not just qualified for, but I am max worthy of citizenship. And maybe if we do this, maybe then you will finally stop inventing these lies about my intellect my courage and my work ethic. And then the boulder rolled back down the mountain and Sisyphus had to get back to work. Each time she said to the world, this is what they did to my boy. In 1955, in the same period, that a political thug named Joe McCarthy is destroying people's lives with allegations of a communist in every corner and every nook and cranny in the United States. Pulled out of his pocket in Wheeling, West Virginia, I have on a sheet of paper the names of 250 known communists in the State Department. And so it went. Lies on top of more lies on top of more lies. I don't know where Mamie Till got the strength to look at her son. But this was a turning point. And you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with historical turning points. Like what was it that finally, you know, was the thing that finally moved men, you know, in, in, in legislatures to, to say, yeah, women have the right to vote. Not we're going to give them because that, that presumes some type of you know, cosmic control. No, women have earned the right to vote. They've had it all along. What finally caused that change? What was it that finally caused you know, the, 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 the civil rights movement to begin? Many people will say the civil rights movement began with Rosa Parks and her act that initiated the Montgomery bus boycott. And there's much truth to that. However, this happened before then. Many people, many historians have said that it was this right here. Mamie Till saying 
And there's a video where she does say this. She says, I intend for my son to not have died in vain. And so if his death can serve any purpose, let it be this. They're killing the children too. If you're killing the children, there's nothing you won't do. And it wasn't that they hadn't been killing the children. After all, they had stolen the children. They sold the children from 1619 to 1865. So it wasn't new, but there was something about the way they killed this child, the brutality of it. You see, you don't beat up a child like that unless you think that somehow they're not human, that they're not smart, that they're not worthy of life, that they're not competent. All those beliefs and the inherent belief that you feel entitled to do that because you know you'll get away with it and then you do. That kind of culture, that kind of assumption, that kind of presupposition, that kind of entitlement, you got to fight against that. And so I think the logic was this. They're killing us anyway. They're killing us anyway. But those World War II veterans that had gone and fought for freedom and democracy thousands of miles away and came home and couldn't find it at home, enough was enough. Enough was enough. And their children, the children of those World War II veterans. By 1955, by 1955, there's something called the baby boom going on. Their children were like, you know what? We're not having it. So that face launched a revolution. That face was a tipping point. She got involved herself, spent the rest of her life making sure that the anguish of a mother, a black mother, did not just get swept up into the mist and dustbin of history. Her son was remembered, and there has been memorials down in Mississippi to Mattel. I read every now and then that people drive by shooting at the memorial, shooting at the sign, or defacing it, putting graffiti on it, writing racist remarks. So it's still controversial, apparently. No matter how many times we visit this, this issue of Emmett Till through the eyes of his mother or anybody else's eyes, we have to ask, how is this possible in the United States of America where so much has gone right in the name of Republican constitutional democracy? How is it possible where so much can go right, and then there's this too. Nothing would ever be the same after Mamie Till decided to have that open casket. She, in her own way, she took the tragedy and re-engineered it, and then gave it to a gift, gave it as a gift, not to black people, but to a nation to a nation because rest assured, sure, if it is possible in a constitutional democratic republic to deny civil liberties to one person, it's not a question of can it be done to other people? Yes, it's just a question of how soon before it gets to you too. All it takes is the wrong moment and the wrong leadership to determine that you too are unworthy. Say your questions. Let's take a moment first. Let's take a moment to to. This was. This was a heavy lift. I get it. So let's just take a moment just to decompress. A moment like this. It is good to remember. It is good to remember. It's good to remember. It's good to invest in the people like those who testified yesterday before the one assist committee who said that their allegiance to the Constitution was stronger. They held firm to their the oath that there are people out there like that. Doesn't mean we can back off the accelerator. It just means that there are people out there like that who say, you know what, you disagree with me, but men and women of character.
They're out there and they're all in here. So what do you think? What are your questions? Question, did he die in vain? No, he did not. Emmett Till is a significant link in a chain of events that led to the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And it showed people, people who would otherwise deny that such things could happen, and people have been denying. But Mamie Till said, yeah, you may never go to a lynching, and you may dismiss that, and it may be commonplace. But this, there's something heinous and just so evil, not brutal, evil about what happened to Emmett Till that it captured the imagination. It was lightning in a bottle. It was the right moment in time. No, he did not die in vain. I'm, I'm thinking about the whole notion of impunity. Yes. The people that murdered Emmett Till had to go in front of a trial, right? Then it had a jury. Was it a jury of peers? It isn't that no. that it wasn't a jury, it wasn't a jury of his peers. Okay. Or her peers. They're not Emmett's peers and not Mrs. Till either. Yeah. Who were on that jury? Was it an all-white jury? Yes. That's right. All men, all, all white. All white from Mississippi. In Mississippi. And that's, so his, the, that's so the, his peer. So the wind was not at their back. No. Right. Thank you. Judy used the word impunity. Impunity. I have another presentation that I did uh, out at uh, Washington and Jefferson College earlier this year, back in February, where the issue was talking about the tyranny inside of the tyranny inside of America's democracy. Now, at first pla at first pass, that might that might strike you know people as being what do you mean tyranny? You mean like tyranny in Nazi Germany style? Well, okay, or tyranny uh, you know Joseph Stalin style? Uh, but just let's talk about tyranny. Tyranny, according to its definition, is when you have a type of government where people that the needs and the needs and issues and concerns of the people are always subservient, secondary, tertiary to the ruling part, the central the central person that's got all that control, and people are left feeling vulnerable. And they are vulnerable. When you are a person being lynched in Marion, Indiana, it doesn't matter if the rest of the country is a, de a constitutional democratic republic. In that moment, tyranny is an operation. And what's even more problematic is that inside of that constitutional democratic republic, somebody's made room for that to happen again and again and again. So until we resolve that, whether people can do that, Judy, with impunity. And what do they do with impunity? Impunity, meaning they have fear no reprisal. Why do they not fear that? Because there's never been any applied. Go back to YouTube a few weeks ago and look at those three men that murdered Ahmad Arbery, the young man that was running through his own neighborhood in Georgia a few, what, a year or so ago. Those three men, look at their faces when the sentences are handed down. Their, their, eyes are, their eyes are filled with utter shock and surprise that they're actually being sentenced. They thought they had the right to go chasing this guy in a pickup truck and kill him. And the fact that they were held accountable is like, what, seriously? Yes, seriously, finally. Okay, <clears throat> thinking of the jury trial that was, you know, all set up to convict him or, or to free him. Those guys, I'm thinking of where it's very obvious what happens. And I'm thinking of the January 6th uh, conversation, people denying what's very obvious. Not so much on the, you know, in the, our society who don't believe that, you know, that like that, uh, <clears throat> that phone call to Georgia to change the votes. Mm -hmm. And people just, no, no big deal. Well, big deal to me. Okay. There's one of my, one of my favorite books is by Herman Wilkinson entitled The Winds of War. Okay. War, war to me. If you haven't read it, I really recommend it. But two volumes said, the second one, War and Remembrance, in, in The Winds of War, Herman Wook has a, there's a German, a German general where, who asked a question, speaking to, I think, a British diplomat. And the question is asked, why didn't, you know, when the Nazis came to power, why didn't more people leave, especially Jews? Why didn't they, you know, why did they stick around? 
Well, the answer was, you know, because things like these pogroms and that kind of harassment that happened, it had been cyclical, right? Like a sine wave. It had happened throughout history. So they figured that this guy's just another crackpot. Once he gets into power, he'll and he gets and he gets settled in, you know, solidifies himself, then he'll back off and things will go back to normal. Well, that's okay if that's what happened, but that didn't happen. So he comes to power in 1933. Then there are the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, which write Jews out of their citizenship like that. And then in 1933, the same year he comes to power, Dachau opens up 30 minutes outside of, outside of Munich. How do you take the Nuremberg Laws of 35, Dachau opening up and other camps opening up where political prisoners of people who are threats to the state and of course racial minorities who don't qualify for citizenship, how do you not interpret that as being a signal for you to leave? Well, because people saw themselves as being, in many cases, being more German than Jewish, or they had fought in World War I, why would their government do this to them? They're loyal citizens. And so Herman Wu came up with this phrase called the willingness to not believe. And that is the ability, and this is, again, it's, it's a fictional book, but it applies to your question. It is people's ability to deny reality, even in spite of the fact that they're seeing it with their own eyes. Such is, the, such is the powerful nature of the human mind and psychology that you can see a thing and then decide, nope, it's not there. And it is utterly baffling to me. But Herman Wook, the novelist, has come the closest to explaining that phenomenon that I've ever seen or read. Ukraine. Same thing in Ukraine, yes. But at the same time in Ukraine, you have state-run media, which is calling it one thing, and people are at great, great risk if they try to find out, uh, find out a truth. But of course, that doesn't explain the Russian soldiers who are out there doing those things. They are seeing things. Right. Yes. What's next? Yes. I, yeah. Uh, it just um, the the impunity thing, and you alluded to it in January in the January six hearing yesterday. Mm -hmm. With, um, I mean, Lady Ruby had to leave her home for two months. That's right. And the FBI told her to leave. It wasn't her personal decision. She did listen to them, and which was a good thing. But I wondered, what, why wasn't there some protection offered to her? And what's going to happen to them now? Because this mob is still out there. Mm -hmm. And they, are, they clearly feel that they can act with impunity towards mm -hmm. anyone, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but especially people that are vulnerable. Yeah. I have... Um... I just, I, I just tell y'all, you know, that I talked to friends of mine back in the DC area, family members. I said, look, you know what? I said, you know, they've always been coming after us. So as far as, far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned, it's not new. This is nothing new. So there's always been an element, element of risk for me and us. The real question now is, when it starts coming after everybody else, now what? That's what, that's, that's what, that's where the real test is going to come, because. This, I, when I ran for Congress in 2008, and thank you for the three people who voted for me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was one more than I expected to get. <laughs> but when I ran, you know, one of my first, one of my first campaign meetings, house parties, et cetera, no, I can I, you know, I'm brand new at this. I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm, but I'm a historian. So I started talking about the Declaration of Independence, you know, and I think this is an Ameri every American's right and duty to do this. And, and I started talking about we hold these truths to be self evident and all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And so afterward, the guy that hosted the party was furious with me. He grabbed me, he says, What's the matter with you? I said, What are you talking about? What are you in there talking about Thomas Jefferson for? I said, he's a founding father. What are you doing in there quoting the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? I said, are you kidding? <laughs> he said, no one wants to hear about that kind of stuff. They want to hear about the economy and healthcare and, 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 and you know, foreign policy. Well, you know what? If I could go back to that, after what I've seen the last couple of years, if I could go back to that moment, I would tell that guy, let me tell you something, bub. Okay, full disclosure, I would I wouldn't use I'd say something else besides bub. <laughs> I would tell him people need to hear more, not less of the declaration, more of the constitution, not less of it. 
Okay, because it is not knowing those things. It is not adhering to those things. Or as, as Barbara Jordan said in 1972 when she was testifying about the Watergate hearings, she told the chairman that the, she told the chairman of that committee. She said, "Mr. Chairman, for a long time, I thought the Constitution had left me out as a black woman, because in 1787, when they said we the people, it didn't include her. It didn't include women. We did not include women. It did not include Native Americans. It did not include poor people. It didn't include immigrants. Quite frankly, it didn't. It didn't include most white men, because you had to be wealthy, white, and male, and most people were poor." And it absolutely did not include black people. So in 1787, we is a very narrow sector or segment of American society. But she said at the Watergate hearing, she finally has been included through amendments. She said through the amending process, I finally have been included. And then she said, my faith in the constitution is whole, it is total, it's complete. This is a black woman from the state of Texas talking about my faith in the constitution is whole, it is total, it is complete. You know what? If it's good enough for Barbara Jordan, it's good enough for me. We need more of it, not less of it. There you go. That's right. Uh, would you connect the uh, Emmett Till to the critical race theory? And what that is- How do you need to connect it? Well, in terms of what I'm saying is, you know, what does uh, the passing of critical race theory laws do to Emmett Till and, and this whole discussion? About well, if, if, if we follow the people who are, who are broadcasting or who, are, who insist that critical race theory is a threat to good order and civilization, et cetera, and so on, then what you do is they, they also want like the like the school board in Tennessee, the, the school board in Tennessee that wanted <laughs> textbooks to not refer to black slaves or slaves, but guest workers. <laughs> I, I I kid you not. Or 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 and you know Texas and California are two of the largest school systems in the country. So publishers pay attention to what they want. I mean publishers are in the business of you know they publish books, but they're 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 businesses. So they're gonna provide what their customers want. So the people that, are, so the critical race theorists, alarmists, they want us, I, I think from what I can gather of them, they want us to have that version of history that will be produced by D.W. Griffith. Okay, and here's the thing, this is, this, is, this is what I have been saying most recently. We have to develop in the, in the United States of America, the ability to have two thoughts at the same time. We have to have the ability to say Thomas Jefferson was a slaveholder and that was a despicable activity. And also a person that had a, that so he, you say had a relationship with, but you know, you had to actually talk to Sally Hemmings and say, was it a relationship if you had no choice? So there's that part. So Thomas Jefferson did that, which, um, which is profoundly appalling. But at the same time, he also wrote the Declaration of Independence. Do we discount the one because of the other? Or can we find a way of balancing the two? And let's get theological for a moment and say, gee, you know, I'm wonderful in front of you guys, but not always when I'm by myself. Still the same body. Is it possible to have two realities in the same person? Yes, it is. That's why we need salvation. So is it possible that George Washington can be hailed as the father of the country, his excellency? And when I talk about George Washington, I say his excellency, George Washington. When I say George Washington was the best of any generation, I don't say that tongue in cheek or facetiously or sarcasm. I mean that as a man of character and leadership, George Washington had that. George Washington was also a slaveholder. My God, I wish he hadn't been. But every generation has its burden to do its heavy lifting, to do its part, to take us to the next level of progress. And the only question is, will we give ourselves an excuse for not doing that because we're too busy doing business other than democracy? Right now, 
In 2022, as far as I am concerned, as an African-American patriot, is that this democracy as a constitutional republic must survive. Because if it doesn't, everybody else's pet issue, climate change, gender issues, transgenders, whatever your concern is, it's off the table because the people who are trying to overthrow this thing, they're not worried about none of that stuff. All right. Fred. Yes. Fred, we have some questions waiting for you on chat. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ian. Fred, they're, they're, they're great bookends to today's conversation. The first being uh, recognizing a similar incident that did take place in Emmett Till's uh, hometown of Chicago, which launched the Red Summer of 1919. Yes. Can, yes. You, can you draw some connections between those two events? Yes. There was the, the Black kid in 1919. And here's the thing that here's the thing that's even more ironic about this, Ian. It's 1919. World War I is over. The peace conference is going on in 1919 in Versailles. Black soldiers have fought in World War I. They've done a real good job in World War I. The Harlem Hellfighters, I mentioned them, they've, uh, they have managed to amass a great wartime record of performance. So there's no question that Black men are patriotic, they'll go fight, they'll do it because they want to prove their citizenship, to prove themselves, and to, frankly, get out of America too. Eugene Bullard, born in Georgia, Will leave America. Will leave America at the age of eleven, stowing away on a merchant marine, a merchant ship, bound for Hamburg that ends up in Scotland. I don't know how that happens, <laughs> but he eventually finds his way to London, and in the World War One, he flies as a fighter pilot for the French Air Force because the American Air Force won't let him. In 1919, though, the year that we're trying to hammer out a peace conference at Versailles, a black kid in Chicago swims in the wrong part of Lake Michigan. How do you swim in the wrong part of Lake Michigan? Got to ask somebody from 1919. So white beachgoers start throwing rocks and bricks at him, gets hit in the head, and he drowns. Black beachgoers in Chicago see this. They get indignant, understandably. There's a confrontation. The cops come and arrest the black beachgoers. And then white mobs go through the black sections of Chicago, pillaging and plundering for several days. Judy, with no, with no punitive response, with impunity. Two years later, two years later, in a place called Tulsa, Oklahoma. You all know where I'm going, right? Tulsa, Oklahoma, because everybody knows about Tulsa now. At Tulsa, Oklahoma, a mob goes through there from May 31st to June 2nd or 3rd. They burn down the Black Wall Street. Why? For among other reasons, black people in the block, the Black Wall Street, they are business owners, they're educated, they're elegant, they're erudite, they're sophisticated, and they're articulate. They completely defy and shatter the stereotype of mumble-mouthing, knuckle-dragging morons and cowards that Jim Crow segregation says they're supposed to be. So what black people managed to do, in spite, here's the thing, here's the miracle. In spite of Jim Crow segregation, where the law, the economy, politics, and everything's against you, they still managed to succeed. So clearly, these are citizens who can add to the country's GDP, whatever is going on. They do that, but because they are breaking the rules, because they're not being who I think you should be, they literally come in there and burn them to the ground and turn them into paupers. And then start lecturing them about, you need to work and put yourself up by your bootstraps. For real, man. Are you serious? So Emmett Till, that kind, of, that, that kind of level of impunity that happens in Chicago, that got transferred to, um, uh, that got transferred to, that happened in Chicago, which by the way happened in East St. Louis in 1917. So there's East St. Louis 1917, there's Colfax in 1866, there's Memphis in 1866, then there's, like I said, East St. Louis 1917, then to Chicago, 1919, then Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921, then Rosewood, Florida, 1923. Ian, sometimes I had done research on this and the numbers and names are adding up so much, I just stopped doing the research because it's just too hard. And in each and every instance, the kind of impunity that was leveled against Emmett Till was alive and well in Chicago and in Tulsa and in Marion, Indiana. Thank you for that response, Fred. That was a great, uh, 
preface that you gave to give us the context for that question. Now, the next question here yes. uh, from uh, guests on Zoom is asking about the post context following, and maybe this is a, a question better served for next week, following uh, Emmett Till's mother's decision to uh, have the open casket funeral and the images that circulated from that. Do you see a, con a contextual connection between her as a parent showing the death and uh, the uh, uh, photos of her son compared to today with the victims of school shootings and being their photos being uh, visible to uh, audiences on TV. Absolutely, you you will you, listen. What can you find? Can you find a more determined, obsessed, and 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 passionate warrior for change, for safety and children's safety, than a parent who's lost a child? You know, children will die for various reasons, diseases or whatnot that we still haven't dealt with. But a school shooting that doesn't have to happen. Emmett Till didn't have to happen. So a wounded parent who now it's like she's got a nuclear engine inside of her, you know, nuclear power doesn't go out very quickly. So like the children of these schools, like the parents of these children that die from school shootings, they are determined that change will occur. It's not a question of if, just when. So yes. And with that in, please tell the other people online, as my, as my colleague, Dr. Scott Vandestu would say, tell them to keep their powder dry. I'll see y'all next week. Thank you, Fred, very much.